I've always played down the hype of CBDC, central bank digital coins, tokens. They already have them. There's no, the dollar is a central bank digital coin. The only thing that's <laughs> stopping it from being 100% digital is that there are $100 bills in your pocket, but that only represents what, 1%, 2% of the currency? In Europe, there are many countries that barely have any paper money. Is your crypto working for you? It can be with yield farming. But what are the risks? Hacking, volatility, poor smart contracts, scams. Even if you overcome the risks, there are still limitations. Do you have a million dollars to invest? Yield farming is a very complex, time-consuming, and expensive process. Can you imagine that not only you need to possess advanced skills to mitigate your risk and check smart contracts, but also you need to quit your job? In order to get the highest return, you need to manage thousands of platforms and check protocols around the clock. Well, not anymore. We are proud to announce the SwissBorg Smart Yield account. It's now possible for anyone to earn yield on most of your cryptos, such as USDC, Bitcoin, Ether, BNB, and only starting with 10 euros with the tap of your finger. So how does it work? It's simple. On a daily basis, Oracle scans and monitors all the different investment opportunities and delivers for you the best investment returns. So how is that more secure? Not only do we assess the best risk reward ratio, but also your assets are protected for our MPC technology and our safety net program. And how it does deliver return? Well, because our system is scanning the market every single day, you get the optimal return on that day. How do you get started? It's easy in three different steps. The first one, you deposit. The second one, you start the yield program. And the third one, you start relaxing, enjoying your passive income. So guys, you know what to do. Subscribe to the Smart Yields, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. Dear crypto community, blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have a returning guest. A Bitcoin OG, Bitcoin Maxi, Tone Vase. A pleasure to have you, brother. Hey, it's awesome. Place. Alex, uh, always a pleasure. Uh, lovely backgrounds here in Dubai. Man, it's so hard to travel the world these days. So hard, and you're spending like half of your life on a plane. You're like constantly on a plane. I know, uh, the quarantine uh, did not fit me well. Uh, I really enjoyed the travel life, speaking at conferences interacting with people and all that had to stop for a year. But now I'm just gonna keep traveling to any country that is accepting tourists. Amazing, and I'm grateful. I was so lucky to bump into you literally yesterday, last minute, but that's how life is. We're one small family across the globe, which is very cool. By the way, guys, we're gonna have a summarized version on CryptoSlate. So if you want the written text about this interview, don't forget to check them out. CryptoSlate is one of the best news outlets in the crypto space, so. So, Tone. Last time we had Max Kaiser on the show and uh, we did kind of like Bitcoin versus different type of currencies right. and stuff like that. And, and, and I remember uh, in our last interview, you talked about Bitcoin versus stocks and then stocks versus gold. We did already touch upon a, lot, a few things and amazing how you talked about the S&P 500, like adjusting for, for the companies that are still, you know, a part of. Yeah, well, look at Tesla, you know, Tesla forced its way into the S&P 500. Market cap got too big. Tesla just bought Bitcoin. And you can see how the S&P 500 is adjusting for the future because now Tesla is in the S&P 500 and the more Bitcoin Tesla buys as a strategic reserve, the more correlated Tesla is to Bitcoin. And now Bitcoin is literally in the S&P 500. And that's why the S&P 500 will always rise while something like gold will always just buy you a nice suit. <laughs> That's exactly what you said in the other, pre oh, I love how you interconnected <laughs> most interviews like that. That's perfect. And I want to talk about gold as well, if, if that's okay with you. So first, round one, Bitcoin versus fiat. Oh man, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure, uh, I, I, 
Bitcoin doesn't have to go very far to win round one, probably for the knockout of the bout. Uh, because just in the last, what, 12 months, uh, the U.S. government alone printed 20% uh, of all its currency in existence that it has ever existed. And the U.S. government was one of the more responsible countries printing their money. Canada went like 40% or something. Insane. And even throughout all that, uh, the U.S. dollar is still dropping versus other currencies like uh, the euro, which has always been stunning. If you, I don't know if we got into this in our last interview. It was two parts, so we could have gotten into everything. But uh, I've always been a U.S. dollar bull. I've been a huge dollar bull. Um, I had my gloom and doom phase listening to guys like Doug Casey and Peter Schiff and... Uh, Jim Rickards, uh, Gerald Salente, I can name these guys all day long. You know, the sky is falling, the dollar is gonna die, everything. And I got out of that mentality almost a decade ago because I realized it's insane. Uh, the US government is the most stable. Uh, the US has the biggest economy. Uh, the US dollar isn't going anywhere uh, because the only thing that matters for a currency is the confidence of the people doesn't matter what the government does, doesn't matter how big your military is, you don't even need a military. It's the confidence of the people, not only your people, of your own country, but also, but more so the people around the world that they trust your currency more than their currency. I just flew in from Tanzania, the freest country in the world right now, Tanzania. No masks, no nothing, no COVID tests needed to get in or out from their country. And they accept their own currency and the do and dollars. So you can use your dollars anywhere there. Uh, they prefer dollars. It's great. So they trust the dollar more than they trust their own currency. But everything changed on November 3rd. On November 3rd, when the election was fraudulently stolen from Donald Trump and handed to Joe Biden, that's when I lost all respect and all confidence in the US political system. And that means that I can no longer trust the US economic system. And that means the US dollars days are numbered. That is what caused it. Because this showed that the elites don't care what the people want. They will do whatever the hell they want. They will fraudulently hand the election because they don't like a candidate that the people want. And this is how the U.S. will start to lose respect of all the people around the world. Why would any other president around the world respect Joe Biden when they know the election was just stolen? This is why the dollar is crashing against the euro. Because at least the euro is a little bit more decentralized. And this gives us back to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is skyrocketing. Not because the dollar is falling, even though the dollar is falling. It's skyrocketing because the faith in the U.S. political system and its monetary system is being lost by the people because they're going to lose confidence in it. It doesn't help that they forcibly shut down all of the businesses. But even if they didn't shut down those businesses, I no longer respect the U.S. government. Zero. The country that my family fought to immigrate to from communist Russia, I no longer respect it. And when I told my parents, I am now making attempts to surrender my US passport because I no longer respect this country. My dad completely understands, but my mom, she's still, they're in their 70s now. She still thinks America is the greatest country ever because this is what we fled communism for, but not anymore. This is how it changes. And Bitcoin is just perfectly right there. The, the, even today, what was the news today? That uh, banking system went down. The, the, the Federal Reserve uh, money system went down. I didn't really read the, the article fully. I saw the headline. Bitcoin doesn't go down. And between the money printing, the loss of faith in the currency, uh, Bitcoin is just perfectly right. It just needs maybe another five years, a little more confidence, a little more stability, a little more privacy, a little more scaling. 
it cannot handle mass adoption right now, but in a few years, maybe five more years, I do think Bitcoin will be the world reserve currency. Amazingly put. So do you, do you believe that the US dollar could go through the hyperinflation or like you said, all these guys that are falling before, are they kind of far-fetched? It can now. It can, it now. can now. I would have never said that uh, I, three months ago, but it can now because our hyperinflation is not a we print too much money event. Countries print too much money all the time. Hyperinflation is a political event. It's always a political event. It's when the people lose faith in the currency and nobody wants to accept it. They would rather accept a bag of rice. They would rather accept anything. Uh, that's when hyperinflation hits. Hyperinflation hit Zimbabwe when a new regime came in, took away land, handed it to the poor people, all the rich entrepreneurs left. What's left in the country? Uh, Venezuela, the fraudulent election again. You know, Chavez was voted in stupidly, but voted in, but that's it. Then he rigged the elections going forward. People lost faith in their government. Here comes hyperinflation. Venezuela didn't hit hyperinflation because they printed too much dollars, too much uh, pay, uh, pesos. They hit hyperinflation because the people lost faith in their government. And that's when it all goes to shit. So, and I do think that the line has been crossed where Americans are losing faith in their government. I think states are going to secede. I think Texas will potentially secede. They will probably join other nearby states like Oklahoma, Florida, uh, and they may secede from the U.S. government because people feel like they have been cheated. And what else can they do but to vote with their money and with uh, their feet? Mm, that makes so much sense. And it sounds like a head, head kick knockout for, for fiat right there, just based on those arguments. Are there any other fiat currencies where you feel like, okay, I can still store some of my wealth in like the Swiss franc or some potential currencies where you feel less stressed or less concerned about like at this moment? Or Not really. Not really. Uh, not really, because Hong Kong is being taken over by China. Uh, you have, uh, uh, I don't, tr China is... Uh, China started going capitalist about two decades ago, but in the last decade, they've reversed course and they've gone back into, uh, you know, authoritarianism. Russia just can't be trusted. No, I think this fiat, uh, we will witness a full fiat collapse in our lifetime. Amazing. So th moving into the CBDCs, some people say, yeah, but CBDCs offers, you know, the government trust, which, which by the way, you'd say there's zero of it. Uh, is that the exact same story for a CBDC versus Bitcoin? Yeah, it's an exact same story. Uh, I don't, uh, I, I've always played down the hype of CBDC, central bank, digital coins, tokens. They already have them. There's no, the dollar is a central bank digital coin. The only thing that's stopping it from being 100% digital is that there are $100 bills in your pocket, but that only represents, what, 1%, 2% of the currency? Uh, in Europe, there are many countries that barely have any uh, paper money. Uh, pretty soon, several countries in Europe will not have any paper money. It's very difficult for the United States to go fully digital because these dollars are used all around the world. But for any other country with... Uh, good uh, technology, good internet, they don't need paper money anymore. And that's a dream for central banks. And unfortunately, they were not able to achieve this dream before Bitcoin came along. They want that dream for three reasons. And it's in the presentation that I do that I know you've watched and enjoyed called Bitcoin Value Proposition. And I give three reasons why the governments don't want paper money. Uh, reason number one is that they can set any monetary policy that they like. If they don't want people saving money, they can force a negative 5% interest rate. If they want people saving money, which never happens, they will raise the interest rate. Uh, without paper money, uh, there's no such thing as a bank run. You've heard these things, bank run, but there is no bank run. There's no ATM machines. You don't need them. There's no lines. Uh, in my presentation, I have pictures uh, from the 1920s, uh, people rushing to, the, to get their money out of a bank, and Greece in 2015, 
people rushing to the ATMs because when they shut down the Greek financial system, they were only allowing people to withdraw 20 euros a day uh, or they changed the rule after a few weeks, they can withdraw 400 euros for the week. And uh, everyone rushed to the ATMs, but these pictures will, know, will only be in the history books because there's no such thing as a bank run. What are you gonna put your money on a CD, on a thumb drive? <laughs> like, what are you gonna do? Uh, and the, but the biggest reason is to the government, every single citizen is a criminal tax evader. And the only reason why they haven't given us a utopia is because we're all cheating on our taxes and we just don't give them enough money. Like as an example, uh, this year in 2020, uh, well, normally the US government collects, collects approximately $1 trillion in tax revenue. But the US government costs two to three trillion a year. In 2020, they printed like $20 trillion. Why are they collecting this $1 trillion of taxes if they're gonna print 20 trillion? It, it makes no sense. But apparently the tax evasion is what's preventing the government from giving us a utopia. And they think they will eliminate all of their, the, all these three problems by removing paper money. And if they do remove paper money, Bitcoin will go 10X overnight. It would skyrocket because Bitcoin is the replacement of paper money, but it's so much better than paper money because you can also use it on the internet. Beautiful, another <laughs> round two over. Moving to round three, Tone. Uh, you touched upon this in our previous uh, interview, uh, Bitcoin versus gold. And obviously you've had also many debates also with some of the big guys and Seyfedean as well. I believe it was against Peter Schiff himself. Uh, any updates since then? And obviously we, we know your opinion, but do you mind telling us a little bit of that fight? Yeah, so gold has broken out to a new all time high, which is impressive and it's good. And I still have some of my gold. I still have a bunch of silver. I'm very bearish on silver. Uh, let's start with silver first. I know a lot of people are big on silver. Uh, Seyfedean's book actually made it very, very clear. Silver has been amazing money for 5,000 years. It was more common as money than gold because it was more readily available. And pre-1900, pre-electricity, pre-modern banking, silver was absolutely necessary because you couldn't buy your cup of coffee with gold. It was too expensive. It needed a micropayment. The peasants needed money and there was not enough gold to go around. So in order to subdivide gold, silver was the common money for the people. But in the modern age of technology, you can subdivide gold. If the world did go back to a gold standard, which I doubt it would, but if it did, gold can scale to the smallest micropayment because it's still gonna be centralized. Gold at a bank and you can just subdivide it as much as you can. So because you can do that, why do we need silver? Since you no longer need a micropayment. So silver is the original shit coin uh, to something valuable like gold. And, uh, but gold versus Bitcoin is another big dynamic and I feel really sorry for the gold bulls that still refuse to admit that Bitcoin is better version of gold because Gold is just, it doesn't have the biggest, most important properties that Bitcoin does. Number one, unconfiscatability. Uh, Bitcoin is unconfiscatable, but gold isn't. Uh, Bitcoin is the first unconfiscatable asset humans have ever owned. And that power is still beyond most people's understanding, how powerful that is. The ability to store your wealth in your head until we get to a world where we have, uh, what's that movie, Inception? Inception. Where someone can go into your head and steal your private key. Uh, Bitcoin has just become the most valuable asset the world has ever seen because of that. But your gold, since the age of metal detectors, can be confiscated. How do you transfer your gold across the world? You can't. Metal detectors will find it. Uh, gold is also not really censorship resistant because unless you're paying someone in person, but we have an interconnected world, we have the internet. So gold can't transfer like that over 
you can decompose it into its elements, into its atoms, to send it to someone. And uh, while gold is finite, just like Bitcoin, Bitcoin is more finite. Bitcoin is more scarce. Bitcoin is harder, does require more work to achieve. Not yet, but very soon, it takes more work to get to, to create new Bitcoin than it does gold. So uh, its stock to flow is better for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just gold for the digital age. And I really wish some of the gold bugs would come too. It's not too late. Peter, <laughs> Peter Schiff, I've never given you a hard time. I'm looking at the camera if you're watching. It's not too late. It's still early. We will, the community will accept you. You can come speak at Unconfiscatable Conference. I'm going to give a plug. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love Unconfiscatable. I own the domain. Come join us. You can be a speaker. Bitcoin is just better. You will feel better when you finally get into Bitcoin. <laughs> Beautifully said. Peter Shave, hopefully you are watching and hopefully you will join our community in the near future. But then another <laughs> knockout there. Um, there. So thank you so much for comparing that. And obviously the, the last round would be, you talked about how gold didn't need silver. And you also talked about in our previous interview how Bitcoin didn't need a Litecoin or any other altcoins. Well, it might have needed it at first. Yeah, like gold definitely needed silver for thousands of years. Uh, Bitcoin didn't really need altcoins, but uh, in 2017, during the contentious hard fork time, uh, yeah, I, I saw Litecoin as being somewhat borderline useful uh, for a minute, but technology advances. And Bitcoin does scale. We have Lightning now. A lot of people think that privacy coins are the future, but they're not. They'll never reach critical mass. They're way more centralized. And while they may be more private at the protocol level, getting in and out of them takes away all your privacy. So if you're looking at old coins to Bitcoin, it's just less secure less useful inflation on top of Bitcoin. Uh, when people tell me that they believe that there will be other cryptocurrencies, uh, I ask, well, then you should believe in the fiat system. Because why do you even believe in cryptocurrencies? Because the digital dollar is the same. Like we have the dollar and we have the uh, Venezuelan peso, and that's insecure, less useful inflation on top of the US dollar. Litecoin is the same thing. They're just a little closer together right now, like the dollar and the euro. Uh, they're a little more similar right now. We can take the dollar and the Russian ruble. The Russian ruble is just a less useful, uh, less trusted, less secure, more inflatable uh, inflation on top of the dollar. Well, that's what Litecoin is. That's what Monero is. They're just less secure inflation on top of Bitcoin. So if you're a believer in hard money, that your money can't be constantly inflated by some guy who wants to print money, then you should not believe in these altcoins because they make no sense to you, if that's your logic. So there is definitely a lot of uh, hypocr hypocriticism for, from people that hate the fiat system, but love the world of many altcoins. Amazingly put. I love how you summarize these things. And this is very exciting to see these battles. Um, you know, obviously, we were just talking about earlier about your Bitcoin value proposition presentation, which, by the way, we'll put a link in the, in the description box below, guys. It's one of the best talks I've seen and I've watched them numerous times. But, you know, nowadays, I'm sure your pitch is still very similar to what you would say back in the day because you, Bitcoin is Bitcoin. But, you know, if someone comes up to you now that we had this second wave, very strong wave, lot, lots of the new wave of millionaires were, are surfacing at the moment and stuff like that. But how would you get someone to join the Bitcoin community in a kind of concise way? Like, what is your spiel to really move them and, and become a part of our community? No, that's basically my pitch. Uh, when people say, what is Bitcoin? And I even have a T-shirt that says, unconfiscatable, censorship resistant store of value. And... Uh, you just got to pitch it right to the person based on what they need. The thing is, I stopped give, I've stopped. stopped trying to convince people yeah. to buy into Bitcoin. When they need it, they will discover it. You know, eventually, my 
65 year old dad who knows decent English started using email. And eventually he started using text messaging. You know, eventually when you need it, you will learn to do it. You know, eventually when you need to start learning to drive a car, you'll learn to drive a car. For some people it's never, for other people it's, uh, it's at 16 years old. So it's when you need it, that, that, that's when Bitcoin will be useful to you. So when you said, has my pitch changed over the years? I occasionally get to listen to my old interviews from like early 2015, mid 2015, and I haven't changed at all. My views have not changed at all. So Tone, obviously I have to ask you this really critical question. Where are we going in terms of the price? You know, uh, we know that you're one of those guys doing TA lots, even though you want to spend more time in Bitcoin education, mainly where are we headed this, uh, what is this bull market looking like for you? Yeah, so I got a lot of slack for being a big Bitcoin bear for a few years, but I was right. Uh, Bitcoin wasn't a bear market for a few years. I became a bull on Bitcoin in March, 2020, when the price crashed back to below $4,000, uh, and started rallying back up. Uh, that's when I became a bull. And we are rising even faster than I expected. And I thought this would be a good bull market. I am thinking that $100,000 this year is a legit possibility. Um, I think Bitcoin is going significantly higher. I'm very bullish on Bitcoin right now based on the political environment, the global environment. And... Uh, I'm very happy for the ride. Uh, however, I myself want to get slightly out of the trading world that I'm known for and more into the Bitcoin education world. It's really important that people use Bitcoin properly. They need to understand how to use Lightning. I need to understand how to use Lightning. We have the conference called Understanding Bitcoin. Had to cancel it in 2020. Still hoping we can do it in September of 2021, this year. A uh, really important conference that teaches people Bitcoin privacy, Bitcoin scaling, how to properly use it so people aren't scared, how to protect your private keys. And I think that's more important. It's more important that people understand why they need to use Bitcoin and how they need to use Bitcoin than trading Bitcoin. Uh, so hopefully when the price of Bitcoin is high enough uh, and I'm able to, because that's teaching this costs money, it doesn't make money. Uh, and I'm willing to take on that challenge instead, along with the other educational conferences that we do, Unconfiscatable and the Financial Summit. Unconfiscatable is usually in the US. The Financial Summit is more for traders and investors and hedge funds. That takes place at beautiful resorts. Bali, I just came from Zanzibar, saw some beautiful resorts there. Uh, it is more for the high net worth individual. Uh, and of course, understanding Bitcoin in Malta. Fantastic, that's amazing. And you know, 100K coming from you, who tends to be kind of like you were saying, a bit of a more conservative guy relative to the other price predictions, reassures me a lot and really keeping fingers crossed, like you said, that, the, that Bitcoin has a bright future. Thank you so much, brother, for always coming on the show. Second time you guys had Tone Vase, an epic, epic dude, a Bitcoin OG. And by the way, you're gonna have a special, special episode with Tone and Carl at the same time discussing further details on the markets as of today. So stay tuned and don't forget to join us every Wednesday, premiere at a PC near you, 8 o'clock GMT. See you next week, guys.